Hello everyone, I'm Nandini Giri and uh, I'm an assistant professor of human computer interaction and entertainment graphics and also the director of the Entertainment Futures Design Studio at Purdue. Today I'm going to talk about three different uh, sections that's outlined here. The first one is about game designers experience of working on a development project. The second one goes deeper into talking about the various needs, the professional needs of designers and also the challenges faced by game studios. And the final section talks about my own proposal for a maturity framework to look at different areas of expertise and also at variables that can be improved leading to an organizational growth and also for more sustainable and enjoyable experiences for individual designers in the industry. To begin with, uh, designing games can get very stressful. There are periods of scrunch and when that kind of extends, it leads to creativity block, a lack of ownership and also at a studio level, um, it might be difficult to retain employees. Uh, that could be dis dissatisfaction and also uh, delays in the pipeline, which don't really have reasons as to why this is happening. So from my own experience working as a professional in the industry and also during my PhD uh, dissertation work, I ended up uh, talking to designers in the industry, asking them about the reasons why they are in the place that they are in right now, what motivates them into designing games. So here I present three uh, research questions which I ask designers at different levels, be it uh, juniors or senior level designers in the industry and also executives asking them uh, whether the current game design process is enjoyable or not, how much importance is given to designers experience in the whole process itself and what can be done to make the process more enjoyable. So the interviews that I conducted, um, I collected a lot of data and then I did an analysis to look at factors that's really enjoyable. And as you see here in this slide, these were the main factors highlighted by designers. Uh, it starts with the essence of game design. So this comes from a painter who said the aspect of interaction and being able to dynamically get the feedback from our players in being able to give them the experience, the, the real time experience is something that is really essence to game designing and they really enjoy that factor about being a game designer. And next comes the concept of unknown. So you have these boundaries where this is what the game is and this is what the game is not. Uh, but then having player uh, designers having this territory where they can really uh, explore the unknown factors in being able to purposefully connect the different missing links is something that's very enjoyable and finally comes team dynamics. So um, the aspect where you can kind of celebrate together the different accomplishments is something that's very enjoyable. The next one is what is not enjoyable and these are the uh, the main factors that designers felt is really inhibiting their uh, efficiency and productivity in the process. So the first one is fear and threat. Um, you know, this could be something at the studio level, which is maybe, you know, like job security or not being able to have a schedule uh, that really kind of considers the, the holistic aspects of the designer itself. And uh, people were also f uh, feeling threatened when there's an authoritarian vision where uh, creatives don't really tell them the rationale behind why they made certain decisions. So the lack of transparency in the process and habituation. So uh, monotony uh, really creeps into the process. So having designing a process where people feel motivated all the while is quite challenging here, as you see from these factors. Here are a few quotes that I derived out of the interviews and um, it kind of talks about the different themes of what is enjoyable and what is not enjoyable in a process. Uh, the aspect of team comradeship. So this designer was also a basketball player from high school. So kind of taking that spirit into their own team in being able to celebrate those accomplishments. And as I mentioned earlier, finding ways to explore unknown territories. Uh, so I'll read the quote here. All the information shouldn't be immediately accessible, but then having parts of it 
purposefully missing so that designers, they kind of know their boundaries, but they're still exploring various areas and connecting those dots throughout the development stage. Self-expression, and uh, this comes from the self-determination theory. Uh, each person have their own variation of what autonomy means to them, uh, competence and relatedness. They have, uh, you know, like different approaches to it. So kind of finding the right mixture for each of your team member and kind of having that process giving them the opportunity to explore these different areas and um, design as a process of challenge and resilience uh, there's always this balance where designers do need that time where it's crunch uh, they are really kind of tested for their own um, extremes but then also having the balance of a decompression so uh, there's enrichment and learning through the process So this diagram here kind of uh, gives like an overview of what is enjoyable, all the factors that need to be incorporated into a game design process and also the other factors which are not enjoyable that really need to be seen and removed out of it. So um, I've explained in the previous slides of most of them, uh, clarity of vision, design practices where people feel more ownership in being able to share their own philosophy of what design means to them, to their team members, and also having that identity being transferred into the process. And in the not enjoyable factors, I think imposter syndrome was something that almost everyone mentioned that even though they've been working in the industry for many years, uh, there's still the feeling of, you know, like maybe I'm not competent enough or I'm the odd one out. So this was a very uh, general pattern that everyone discussed about in the interviews. So next here is kind of a conceptual um, diagram that shows how a designer is actually interacting with the design process itself and what are some of the experience that comes out of it. Uh, the four main experiences they have out of a process is fellowship, which comes from the team comradeship I uh, spoke about earlier. And then there is the aspect of discovery where they are exploring the unknown. Uh, there's the component of self-expression, having that ownership and identity and also being challenged. So there's the component of learning and enrichment through the process. Next, um, here what I've done is that I took the, the, the MDA framework for game designing. Um, I have reference here in this slide. It's the mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics uh, framework. So I looked back into my interview data, looking for structures which can be actually implemented into the process itself. So as you see in this table here, I have the mechanics, uh, which could be tangible or non-tangible ones like common goals. Uh, these are something that you can plan for ahead of a new project and really implement it in your process. And then you have the runtime dynamics where when a designer is actually interacting with these structures, uh, what is the, you know, the real-time experience of it? So if you have common goals, then synergy is something that's a, a natural output or a consequence of that structure in your process. So uh, I'll leave it up to you to kind of look at, you know, like all the mechanics here and the connecting dynamics. And I move on to the next slide where I show you how it's possible to kind of look at a subsystem, a subsystem um, within each process that a designer can interact with. So I have four different subsystems here based on the table in the previous slide. So you have the process mechanics, be it common goals, shared rituals, having open communication. And when you really have this, say, open communication within a fellowship subsystem in your process, then a designer is definitely going to have more trust. Uh, there is more prospectors for uh, trust building activities and experiencing it as a, an aesthetic of fellowship in the process itself. So kind of, you know, like going in that order, I next have discovery so being able to prototype ideas might give them uh, real world validity and also having a culture of continuous learning so it's not just inspiration coming out of playing games but maybe from another field like say architecture or even a, a fashion catalog uh, designers are able to get those inspirations from other fields and apply it in their own process 
So this one is the discovery subsystem. Uh, the next is expression, uh, kind of going in that same order. Uh, people have their own design philosophies. They'd like to share best practices, which gives them more identity and ownership. And also being transparent about process decisions uh, can help uh, team members have a better aligned mental model so that they value and appreciate some of the decisions that's made at a higher level. And then um, there's challenge. So challenge is always this balance between having this utopian, you know, inspiring development phase, but then there's also the struggle, there's the number of resources, there's the time limitations. So having a nice balance, um, you know, like the crunch decom decompression, um, creating a healthy production pacing, which can lead to enrichment and uh, empowerment for designers. So I showed you some of the enjoyable and non-enjoyable factors in the process. And then I also showed a way of kind of dissecting the data into process mechanics and structures leading into subsystems that you can build into your own processes. So here is kind of a generic guideline. Uh, so anytime you start a new project or a new team is being formed, uh, these are some guidelines that you can kind of play with and see how to make your own process enjoyable and more sustainable so that uh, people are creative, there's always this energy, and you're also having these variables that you can kind of keep altering and ensuring that um, your team members are always motivated. So to begin with, create pillars and anti-pillars for the design process and um, being able to communicate what the design process is about and also what the design process is not about. So this kind of sets the boundaries for your designers so they really know what the, the overall vision is for the project. And then comes the subsystem. So being able to identify, uh, you know, what is fellowship for your own team? What is discovery? What does expression mean for each team member? What is challenge here? And then being able to create these subsystems and implementing it in the process. And also looking at the source and the sink, adding more enjoyable factors, removing factors, so this is something that's all, that can be always customized to your own requirements. So prototyping, playtesting, and re reiterating can really uh, help you keep this creativity sustained throughout the, the game development process. So that brings us to the next section where, you know, talking from the aspect of what is enjoyable, not enjoyable, we move on to look more into uh, the bigger picture, like, you know, what is a game studio's main challenges? As gaming professionals, what are things that we face at workplace that's really uh, counterproductive or even um, making people change careers? So in the next five slides, I'm going to show you five different focus areas for expertise development. And um, the first one is game studio operations. So thinking about build, building an organizationally mature environment so that people have a sustained, uh, enjoyable experience throughout through their career. And uh, each focus area that I'm presenting here has different variables. So studio operation is mainly focusing on leadership, having a cohesive vision, uh, a plan for DEI practices, being more inclusive, uh, a conscious development of studio culture and team building. The next focus area is the development process itself in being able to create more value sensitive and socially impactful products. So here are the different metrics that's uh, being considered. The first one is business metrics. So uh, thinking of games as products, uh, where is the hole in the market? So it's not just about the excitement of a new uh, prototype or a new game idea, but rather thinking about the product, like how am I going to wrap it around so that it's more uh, it's, it can be sold better. Then content, content specific metrics, um, thinking about the demographics, the place where these games are being released. So um, culturalization, thinking more about the social, the political, the economic aspects, the factors that play into how the players are going to receive your game. Uh, process specific metrics, having ways to look for problems way ahead in the pipeline can save a lot of time optimization and also um, thinking about what are some of the values that my products are 
standing for and what's the kind of player base that I'm creating for my own um, games. Then comes uh, game designerly experience. So this has to do mainly about the competence of the design team. So aspects of skills like communication, be it at a personal or at a studio level, having the right tools, the models, the framework. So uh, there are opportunities to do research and also be able to convey the, the design decisions to the team. Uh, next comes mentorship and roles. I think the first experience that a designer has in their first project is something that's really going to uh, influence their career. So having the right kind of mentors and also being able to provide um, like removing ambiguity in job descriptions of what a designer's role is. So being more specific about the, the job roles, the expectations can really help designers. And the last one is design language. Um, most studios, when they speak about games, it's mostly the vocabulary that's used is based on previous experiences or previous games. So having more of an universal design language. What if a person comes from a country where they don't have access to certain games, uh, which also goes into education. So uh, being more proactive in developing um, a studio vocabulary for their own games could be useful. And of course, the main thing is UX maturity. So thinking about your players, uh, be it, you know, uh, a, a whole game experience or is it more to do with player dynamics, the interplay, the community, uh, thinking about game design elements. And the final focus area is design scholarship itself, like what kind of theories can be built for better uh, and more effective workplace practices? Uh, how can it be implemented in education and thinking about research as a way to really sustain um, and make practice more enjoyable? So here are some models that I refer to for building my own framework. Um, the Barrett's model, which kind of uh, builds on Maslow's needs and motivations. And then there is Nelson and Stoltemann's design expertise and McAllister's eight levels of UX maturity. So here I'm kind of summarizing the slides I showed you earlier about what each of the different focus areas are. And you also saw the different variables that strengthen each of these areas. So this is kind of a summarized diagram that shows four focus areas here and what each of the different elements, the key variables are that can really strengthen each of the areas. And finally, here you have the design maturity framework. On screen left, you have the expertise level being from no expertise to uh, being able to build the expertise, becoming a routine expert in that uh, be it a studio or the individual, you know, not being able to identify what the key variables are to actually defining them. And then you build expertise by kind of solving ad hoc problems and developing an in-house identity. And then when you reach a, a routine expertise level, that's when you have things standardized. It's effective, uh, but it's still not adaptive. Uh, the moment something, you know, like a pandemic or a totally weird situation happens, that's when you're realizing that you need to be more flexible so that there's adaptive growth. And then it moves to once to a stage where rather than just being the survival level studio or just being able to navigate through changes, you start thinking about what are some values that I really stand for? What are my products speaking to? What kind of player base is it? And this finally leads to design expertise. So this is kind of the utopian future where everything is self-organized and uh, there's, it's from a selfless service standpoint. Um, you're thinking about giving back to the community. So uh, this kind of provides a gradient, a linear way for how uh, an individual professional or a, state, a studio can kind of identify the various areas for expertise development and also look for the key variables, be it leadership or having your uh, DEI um, policies nailed down to design competence more at an individual level. And this framework provides you kind of a step-by-step -step, uh, procedure of how you really first identify with which level you are at and then find ways to improve. So that concludes my talk and uh, I've kind of crunched 
all the information into these slides. So please feel free to contact me at the email ID that I have provided here. Um, if you test it out, if it works, or if it doesn't work, or you find certain things interesting and ways to improve this conceptual framework, please feel free to contact me. Thank you so much for listening uh, to my presentation, and I look forward to your comments. Thank you.